Well, good morning, Mount Olive. It's good to have you here this morning, and uh, it's beautiful weather. It's good to be in the, the Lord's house on this Sunday morning, and uh, we're glad that you're here with us. If you're a guest, I would love for you to know who you are, so please take the flap of the bulletin, or there's a card in a pew near you, that, a guest card. Please fill that out, put an offering plate in a few minutes when it comes around so we can know who you are and get with you and let you know that we're excited you're here with us today. If you do that, we'd really appreciate it. We do have a few announcements this morning. Um, next Sunday... Uh, we're going to be having a fellowship hall note burning in the youth department dedication. A lot of stuff's been done up there in the youth department this past week, and it looks wonderful. If you have a chance, run, run through there and, and look around. It's, it's, it, they've done a wonderful job of, of working through that. Next Sunday morning, we'll be having our WMU and our Brotherhood breakfast, so hopefully you can come be a part of that at 9 o'clock. The Financial Peace University class starts next Sunday, so... If you want to be a part of that, please see Brother Stanley as soon as possible, and he can help you um, get with what you need to do and be a part of that Financial Peace University class. Also, next Sunday night, we'll be having our Valentine's banquet. We want everybody to come, and you're invited. All we need you to do is just tell us what you want to eat. There's some um, Valentine banquet flyers in the front, the back, and in the Sunday school window. Just sign up. Tell us what you want to eat. We're going to do steak and, and, and grilled chicken. And if you want a steak, just tell us how you like it cooked, and we'll do our best to cook it that way. But that'll be next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Our youth will be serving in that. Um, they'll be here about 4.30 getting ready, and, and they'll be serving you. So we want you all to come and be a part of our church family uh, as we um, um, to celebrate the love of Christ, really, as we, as we serve you through, uh, as a sponsor of the youth department. Bed ministry and the youth renovation will be going on this week. And uh, so if you can be a part of either one of those on Monday or Tuesday or any time during the week, just let us know. We might can try to get some time up there to work. Discipleship Now weekend, which is a huge part of our what we do in our youth department, will be this next weekend, and we're so excited about it. Uh, we want you to be a part of that, all the youth in our church and in our community, but at the same time, we want our adults to be a part of that. And we ask you to start praying over that now for us. Start lifting, lifting our youth up, the ones that will be a part of it, our leaders, um, the other churches that are going to be involved in it with us. We look to have about 80 to 100 students in our community going through um, six Bible studies and then another four personal Bible study times and then three big worship times in, in, a, in between Friday night at 6 to Sunday morning at uh, um, uh, 12 o'clock. So, so we look to having a big time that weekend, but we definitely need your prayers and we cover your prayers. And then l lastly, for the youth department, we'll be having a uh, Super Bowl get-together tonight at the, after, after our evening service at the Cunninghams. We want you to come be a part of that with us as well. If you would, we're going to read a scripture this morning out of Colossians chapter 3. If you'd stand with us um, while we read this, I'd really appreciate it. So we're going to start in verse 1. It says, um, If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed in him with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of the earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For, it, on, for it, it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked, and when you were living in them, but now you also put these them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self and its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who, who is being re renewed in a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, um, slave, and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, whoever has a, compl um, a complaint against one another, just as the Lord forgave you, also you sh should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called one body. And be thankful. Let the word of God and the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. 
God, and we do praise you right now for all the things that you've done in our midst. And God, I pray that as we walk in this world, God, that we continue to walk away and leave behind the things that entangle us and then ensnare us, our sinful nature, the things that tear us and bring us down. And God, that we will continue to, 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 to live in your presence. And God, and we will continue to strive to live righteously and holy in this world, God, that people can see you in us and not necessarily see our deeds, but God, the things that you want us to do in the midst of people around us. God, help us to always live on a mission. God, help us to always live with, with a purpose in, in our heart and mind. God, to, to spread your good news to the people around us. Father, I pray, God, that you would help us to love one another. God, truly love one another to the point, God, that God, that is our heartbeat. God, that we bring peace into this world, God, that, that, that we serve in a different way, that we care in a different way than the world sees every day. And, Father, I pray that you would use us specifically in our, in our situation, in our place, in our jobs, God, in our community, in our neighborhoods, in our families. God, use us to be your shining light. God, I pray for those in our church that are, that are hurting, that are going through sicknesses and, and, and rough times. God, we pray that you would be with those. And, God, we pray that you would be with us as a church to be able to meet those needs and help and encourage in those times, Father. And also, God, I pray that you would be with those in our community, God, that need to know you as personal Savior and Lord, God. Those in our midst, God, that need to hear you, about you and fall in love with you, God. I pray that you would use us. Use us to be your hands and feet and your mouth. And, God, use us to love in the way that they will see you. God, they will fall in love with you. They'll change their life and give their life to you. Father, I thank you again for this day. Be with Brother Anthony and Brother Stanley as they, as they preach this morning, as they lead in the song service. Use them to do what they're supposed to do, God. And I pray that you'll receive the glory and that it won't be about us and that we'll respond in how we're supposed to. In your son's name, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. While we're standing, let's have a time of fellowship, please. All right, so good to see you here today. We're going to begin singing Tell It to Jesus this morning, which is hymn 451, and we'll sing the first, second, and last verse.
hymn 445 is Sweet Hour of Prayer. We're going to do all three verses this morning.
And thank you, Brother Anthony, and thank you, choir. So good to gather with you again this morning. It just really hurt me that we couldn't gather together here in this place last Sunday. But I'm glad that we can get together today and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going back to the basics, which means we're going back to Acts chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 41. We'll read through 47 today. And um, we, uh, we will get... Um, cranked back up with our series on uh, the basics, our core Christian values. These are the things that we value so much as a church body, as individual Christians. This is what the Lord has for us through His Word, and we certainly want to obey God's Word and um, be a blessing to Him. So if you're able to stand this morning, I'll ask you to do so as we read the Scripture, Acts chapter 2. <coughs> And uh, I'm going to begin reading um, actually in verse 40. With many other words testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. 
And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You can be seated. So I want to do just a little recap as we go back to the basics. You remember that we took, uh, we're taking all of the letters of the word basic and from this passage, finding our core values. And the B we, we saw meant Bible study. It's Bible study. How important it is for us to study the Word of God. How important it is uh, that we teach the Word of God correctly and rightly divide the Word of truth. It's so important that we share the Word of God and share our lives together in fellowship. And that we care for one another. And uh, through our small groups, find that caring and sharing time. Uh, that's really important, a great basic in the Christian's lives and in the life of a church. So we said the A then stood for adoration. And adoration, of course, is worship. It is adoring our Lord Jesus Christ. And as these gathered together in Acts chapter 2, they went to the temple and they had big group worship time. And then they met in homes because there were 3,000 of them. They had to meet in small groups there. And they also had their Bible study time and their worship time uh, together. So they were together in worship. How important it is that we are together and that we recognize that when we gather together, the Lord is here with us. Where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, there will I be in the midst of them. And of course, they celebrated. They celebrated what God had done for them through Christ Jesus, celebrated the church, celebrated victories, celebrated uh, the, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the A is adoration. And then we said the S stands for soul winning, soul winning. How important it is for us to share the faith that we possess to witness to those who are lost and share the gospel with them. Why do we do that? Because Christ commands it. It's what he wants from us. It's a way that we glorify the Lord when we share Jesus with others. And, of course, when we live Jesus um, and our Christian faith out every day. It means we get to take part in something that's eternal, something that transcends this world and goes beyond this world. And it shows our community, it shows people that we really care about them, that we really love them. So today we're going to go to the I in basics, and that I will be intercession, interceding on behalf of others. And what that is, of course, is prayer. It's prayer when we intercede. Souls are at the heart of Jesus' ministry, and they ought to be at the heart of ours. And when I say souls, I mean people. Think about numbers, and we talk about it today. I don't want to just be a number somewhere. I would rather have some personal communication with someone who knows my name, who knows me, knows something about me, and really cares about me. And of course, that is the heart of Jesus. That is the heart of the church, and it should be our heart today as well. We read back in uh, verse 41 uh, that those who received the word were baptized, and uh, there were about 3,000 of them. That's a big number, right? It's a big number for people to be saved. You don't hardly ever hear of any type of meeting today where 3,000 people are saved at one time. But I want you to think about 3,000 people that were saved that day. They were people. They, it was not just a number. Now, the Bible couldn't record the names of well, it could have. God could have had him record the names of all those 3,000 souls. But what it represented was that there were 3,000 people that were gathered together now in community. They knew Christ, and they were beginning to know one another and what it meant really to live the Christian life. And a great part of living that Christian life, of course, is learning how to pray, how to intercede on behalf of others. We all intercede every day. We, we go to God and we ask God for something for somebody. It might be asking God something for ourselves. Or it might be asking God for something for our family. Or it might be asking God for something 
for our church family or our co-workers or someone that we know and really care about. But we all intercede. And what the Bible says here is that... Um, these, in verse, verse number 42, it says they, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that's teaching, and fellowship, that's gathering together in community, and in the breaking of bread, they, they ate from house to house, and they also had the Lord's Supper together, but it also says, and in prayers. That's the only place that prayer is mentioned in this passage, but I don't want us to overlook it. Because it's so important that 3,000 people were gathered together and they were praying. They understood how important it was to communicate with God and to intercede on behalf of others. To pray for others, for one another. And so I want to share with you today what, what I believe some of these prayers could be. When we think about prayers, all different types of prayers. We do pray prayers of confession, right? We, we pray prayers of intercession, as we're talking about here. We also pray uh, prayers for God to help others and to bless others. And, and we pray all different types of, of prayers, prayers of praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. But I think that there are three particular types of prayers that these saints, when they gather together, could have prayed. And probably did pray. And I think number one, and you see it on the screen, is that they prayed a, a prayers of thanksgiving for the souls that were saved. I know the apostles did because that's, what, that's why they were preaching the gospel. They were praying that God's gospel, that Jesus Christ would make a difference in the life of the hearers and they'd be saved. And so why wouldn't they pray prayers of thanksgiving for, pe- for people who had been saved, for people who's Lives were now changed. Lives were now different. Lives that once belonged to themselves now belonged unto the Lord Jesus Christ. They really had just witnessed a miracle. Because I want you to always remember that salvation is a miracle. You and I coming to Christ is a miracle. Because it's something only God can do. Only God can save your soul and my soul and anyone else's soul. That means it's a miracle. When it's something only God can do, it is a miracle. And so they had just witnessed this, 3,000 people being saved. Salvation by grace through faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. The word was being preached, taught, and souls were being saved. And it was a great time of thanksgiving. When people are saved, we ought to give thanks to God for... um, that salvation that he provides. And I think we ought to do so for at least two different reasons or, or two different things. Number one is, it gives those saved a freedom from the sinful lifestyle they've been used to. And I know you might say, well, what kind of sinful lifestyle would a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old have um, that was saved? Uh, or what kind of sinful lifestyle would even an adult have? But we have to recognize what the Bible says about sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means when we're living for self, it's a sinful lifestyle. It might be as simple as that. And of course, we've seen people saved from various backgrounds and circumstances and things happening in their lives. We've heard testimonies of people that God has saved from addictions. God has saved from from sins. Uh, as serious as murder and beyond, and all those things, God saves. When he saves, he saves us from a sinful lifestyle. He turns our heart around. He helps us understand that our direction was wrong before we came to Christ. That now that we know him, he has put us on the right path, in the right direction, and we are following the Lord away from the sinful lifestyle that we used to live. Someone said, like they were stranded on a desert desert island with no one to rescue them. Like they were gagged and chained and, and no one was there to set them free. But then they heard the gospel. They heard the preaching of the word. The Holy Spirit began to convict and draw them to Jesus and they were repentant and gloriously saved by placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And for a lot of the people who heard the gospel, I'm sure as they were hearing it, they were thinking, this is not what we've heard before. This is not what we have been taught by the religious leaders of the day, the people who are supposed to know how to be saved or or how to tell us to be saved. And now we're hearing about this man Really, this God who became man and who lived a perfect, sinless life. And he died on the cross for me. 
He died for my sins. He died that I might be forgiven. He died that I might know how to live a, a, a righteous life, the right kind of life. And the Holy Spirit of God saying to them, yes, that's what you're hearing. And that is the truth. And they believed. They believed. They placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and they were saved. How many times do we thank God for someone who gets saved because we know they were on the wrong path, going the wrong way, and we know now their destiny has changed. Their eternity forever now is going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be with Him and uh, glory, to gloriously live with Him forever and forever. Well, secondly, I think we can also recognize that they were saved uh, for the freedom to live out their faith. To really live out your faith. And that's what Christianity is all about, folks. It's not about just coming together on Sunday like this. Christianity is about living our faith every day. That's what life is. Living in faith every day. Gone for those who heard the gospel preached that day in this passage was the burden of trying to keep the law to please God. Gone were the rituals that they had to perform so that they could be in right standing with God. Jesus had accomplished all of that on the cross. Jesus took God's wrath for our sin upon him. Jesus fulfilled all of the law uh, in the Old Testament. And now we trust not the law, but we trust in Jesus Christ. So gone was the idea that if you're just good enough, somehow God will accept you. Every believer, every believer from the First time the gospel was preached until now and beyond is saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And no other way. No other way. And every believer should have the genuine desire to live out our faith and make a difference in the world in which we live. Your, your world every day. Where you work, where you play, and where you live. I believe part of the joy they experienced because they understood and they thanked God for salvation. Now, they didn't understand everything about it. They were brand new Christians. They were brand new in the Word. They didn't understand everything. They had to grow, and they had to mature. And you know, that can be the same way today. And I want to illustrate how that works. So, if you grow up in a preacher's house, um, you have to be careful what you do and say, because almost everything can be a sermon illustration, you know? And so my kids have understood that over the years, and my wife has as well. You know, I try to get their permission before I share anything, uh, you know, about that. And uh, so I, I called my daughter this week, and uh, I got her permission to share something today with you. Um, she was born in, in 1987, and she was saved. She was born again on March the 3rd, 1996, which made her a little over nine years of age when she was saved. It was a Wednesday night. And we'd gotten home, or Judy and her had gotten home from church, and I guess maybe I took John with me, I'm not sure, but I drove the bus that night and uh, dropped some kids off. Well, I got a call from Judy before I got home to say that Sarah had gotten saved, that she had called her mama in the bedroom and said, Mama, I need to talk to you, and um, so she said, I, you know, I need to be saved, and so Judy shared the gospel with her, and she was saved. She uh, prayed to receive Christ. Now, of course, I was overjoyed, so happy, and so... Um, I got there and, uh, you know, just, just thankful that God had saved my daughter. You know, my son was already saved and my daughter was saved. There's just something about that feeling of knowing that all of your family is saved, that they love Jesus, you know, they belong to Jesus. But remember, again, she was nine years old, so she didn't know everything about what it meant to be saved. But she wrote her mom a letter, okay? And it was dated March 3rd, 1996, and this is what she wrote. Keep in mind, she's a nine-year-old. And she didn't know everything. She didn't understand everything. But here's what she said. Dear Mom, I love you, and I want to thank you for telling me about Jesus and making me be saved. I love you, and I thank you for what you did for me and everything else you've done. I will never forget when you saved me in February. Remember, she didn't know everything about it. At first, I could not understand, but I got the hang of it. I love you, Mom, so, so much, and I will always love you. And most of all, I will always love being saved and baptized. You, you, um, you really taught me something. 
Thanks a lot, Mom. I love you, three exclamation points from Sarah. She was thankful for being saved and that God had changed her heart and changed her life, even as a nine-year-old. Folks, if your heart is not changed, if there's not a difference in your life, you don't have to know everything. But you have to know that Jesus has saved you and changed your life and be thankful to him for the freedom to live out your faith every day and that God saved you from your sin. Secondly, I think they prayed for wisdom for their servant leaders. I think when those 3,000 gathered together, I think they prayed that the apostles who were teaching them and preaching and ministering to the needs of the congregation, I think they prayed that they would have wisdom following the apostles' lead, watching to see how they uh, responded to the loss, to persecution. They were watching them, but they were praying for them. I believe that. Um, I'm sure the apostles appreciated those prayers. I I know as as a pastor how much I appreciate the prayers of, of my congregation, of my church family. I know how much I appreciate the prayers of anyone. I don't know any pastor or music a leader or youth pastor or deacon or Sunday school teacher that doesn't appreciate the prayers that go up for them. We all need that. We need wisdom as we prepare to preach, wisdom as we prepare to teach. Uh, Brother Anthony needs wisdom as he picks out the music for Sunday services. And Brother Drew needs wisdom as he leads our young people. And the leaders of our children need, to, need wisdom, and we need to pray for that wisdom. One of our presidents said, the greatest thing you can do for me is pray for me. And so I believe that uh, this group in Acts 2 sought for God's help with with the ability to preach and to teach. So those who were leading needed that, and they needed prayers to know how to do that, to be able to preach and teach. I remember when I was first saved, I, I didn't understand everything, but I had a desire to get in the Word of God, and I just wanted to read it. Uh, I didn't know, I didn't understand everything that I read, but I knew that I needed to know more about Jesus. And when God called me to, to pastor, I knew I needed to be more equipped to do that. And so I wanted to enroll in some type of Bible school and perhaps seminary and all those things because I wanted to be a better pastor. I wanted to be able to, to more rightly divide the word of truth and to know how to shepherd uh, God's flock. Um, I wanted to be able to feed the congregations that God would lead me to. Um, and you know, people say, I know sometimes people come in to churches and they say, you know, I, I'm just not getting fed or whatever. Well, I want to tell you, don't expect to get fed if you don't pray for your preacher and your teachers. We need prayers for wisdom and we need help uh, because it's a struggle for us and, and we have to do the hard work of study and, and it is important. How important is Faithfulness in prayer, Dr. Wilbur Chapman often told of his experience as a young man when he came to a church in Philadelphia. <coughs> he had someone come up to him and say, I know you're a young man and uh, pretty new to the gospel and to this church, but you preach the gospel and I'm going to help you all I can. Well, Dr. Wilbur thought, you know, that was, was a little bit of a, you know, uh, maybe a, a shot at him, but uh, what happened next really changed his whole attitude about that and about ministry is this man who had come to him and made that statement came back to him and said, I've got 10 people committed to pray for you every week before the service. And that 10 later turned into 20. And that 20 turned into 50. And that 50 turned into 100 and beyond. And he recognized that the power he got in the pulpit came a a great deal from those who were lifting him up in prayer before he got into that pulpit to share the Word of God. I want to tell you it's important. I need that. I need you to pray for me because I need all the help I can get. And our teachers need prayers. Before you come to Sunday school, pray for your Sunday school teacher. Lift them up. Prepare yourself. Get in the Word and study the lesson yourself and be prepared to communicate in the class, in the small group, and let's learn together and know how to worship together. Let's pray for one another. And your leaders need prayers to help to uh, help with their ability to shepherd the people as well. To shepherd the people. It's not easy for a pastor and youth pastor and a few deacons to minister to everyone in the church. I mean, here in what we read, immediately the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem had 3,000 new members. How are you going to meet the needs of those 3,000 members? And don't you think if somebody uh, felt a little bit neglected that they wouldn't fall away? 
or say, that preacher didn't come see me. He, he wasn't at my surgery. He didn't call to check on me because I'd missed a couple of Sundays. It takes us all working together, checking on one another, shepherding one another. And we need that. We need, we need that because there are lots of surgeries. There are lots of people to counsel with. There are a lot of folks to visit, a lot of folks to encourage. And so I would, I would ask you, would you pray for and with your staff, your deacons, uh, your teachers, that we'll be able to effectively minister and let's all recognize we are ministers. We are ministers. So interceding, praying for wisdom for the servant leaders. And then lastly, praying for a boldness for the church. Because God was adding daily those who were being saved. So they were growing. They were growing in number, which means they were growing in their ability then to disciple more people and share the gospel. The church was having a great influence. They were having favor, it says, with all the people. I wonder if that's true today. If we really have favor with the people outside of the walls of the church. And I I feel like we live in a day where the church is not respected in the community as it once was. I feel like we live in a day where people just, they don't go along with what's right, even if they're not a member of the church like they used to. I mean, it used to be that if uh, some moral issue came up in the community and the church stood strong against the immorality of it, that a lot of people in the community, even if they weren't faithful in church, would, would go along with the church on that. It's not true today. It's not true today. Which means we have to be stronger in that. We have to be more visible in the community. It means we have to show the community in a greater way that we care for them. And that we want what is is best for them. And I'm afraid the reason we don't have that influence is the church has become too much like the world today. And I'm not talking about us in particular. I'm talking about the church as a whole. The church perhaps has become too much like the world. And instead of taking... Church to the world, as Jesus told us to do, we wait and say, hey, maybe the world will come to us. Folks, they won't. We've got to to pray for boldness to take the gospel to the world. Y'all with me this morning? We are not an organization here. We are an organism. We are alive in Jesus Christ. Or at least we're supposed to be. And I'm afraid there are too many churches today that are dead because they won't give up worldly ways. We need boldness to stand for the truth of God's Word and be effective witnesses in our community. Whether that's at school, at a ball game, at work, at the grocery store, if people can't tell a difference in the life of a Christian, we're not going to have favor in the community. We need boldness. And we need people who are willing to be faithful to God's church and come to worship on Sunday and Wednesday in special meetings. It's sad that people won't give up other things and recognize the importance of worshiping God and standing strong in in the the, uh, admonition and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be bold. We've lost our boldness. And I think we're in need of revival. So I'm finishing up by saying we're going back to the basics. And a devotion in prayer is essential to the church getting back where she needs to be. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't feel that just when a crisis comes. I feel that all that's within me, all that's about me every day is insufficient for the day. But I want you to know that in Christ, we find our sufficiency. We find our strength. We find our help. We find our boldness. And and we should give thanks to God for the salvation we've received and for the salvation of others. We need to pray often for our servant leaders and pray for boldness to be different from the world and to be an effective soul winner. I'm sure there is someone today that needs our prayers. Someone today that we need to beg, on behalf, beg God on behalf of. And if you can't think of anyone else, let me throw out a name to you. His name's Stanley. Last name's Huddleston. And he would love to have your prayers. And I love to pray for you. 
And if you ask me to pray for you, I'll pray for you. And I'll call you by name to our Heavenly Father because I know He hears. I know he inter- when we intercede, He hears. And we know that Jesus is at His right hand, the Bible says, ever making intercession for us. I'm glad Jesus is on our side, aren't you? God loves us. He cares for us. He wants prayer, devotion to prayer, to be a vital part of our lives, communicating with God, praying always in everything, and giving thanks, the Bible says, in everything to God. Give thanks in everything to our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, we pray now, thanking you for the salvation we received by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. For those who are lost today, Father, we pray for their salvation. What a joy and rejoicing it would be today to see someone come to Christ. (coughs) What a a joy it would be right now, Father, just to to know that we are all submissive to you. That we make our surrender to you, Father. That we recognize and are thankful for the eternal life you've given us. And that we have the privilege to pray for one another. And that we can find boldness to live for you and witness for you each and every day. But Lord, help us to make prayer central in our lives. Communicating with you, Father. Speaking and listening. And following your word. Save the lost here today. Strengthen the saved, Father. And whatever decisions we have here to make today, may it please and honor you and glorify you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our hymn of response. If I can pray with you, help you from God's word, I'll be glad to. The altar's open. If you want to come and kneel and pray as we sing. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble moment. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Monty's going to play softly as she does. This time of invitation is still open. This is our time to respond to the Lord Jesus. Sometimes he calls us to a public response, which means there's something that we need to do and make that known to the church. Sometimes it's a private response. Something that you just in your heart as you communicate with God right now and pray to him. that You're making that commitment he's calling you to make. If it's something public, like joining the church, You need to come on forward now and do that. We'd love to have you as a part of our church family here at Mount Olive. Many have come to the altar, and it's a wonderful place to come and kneel before God and give Him thanks and glory and honor to pour out our hearts to Him. He knows our needs before we ask, but He tells us to ask and to seek and to knock, and that door will be opened unto us. He's the one who has the keys. He can open and He can shut the door. And our prayer is, thy will be done. 
So as we have this time of response, and I feel the Spirit of God moving strong here, maybe someone else who needs to make a public or even a private decision. As God speaks to us now, let's be faithful to Him. Well, I know that uh, many, if not all of you, pray faithfully for our services before we uh, meet together on Sunday, and I'm thankful for that, grateful for it. And again, always thankful for your prayers for me and my wife and uh, for all the leaders of our church. And uh, when I say leader, I mean servant leader because it's our privilege to serve you. Um, We don't put ourselves on a pedestal, or we shouldn't. And, And I always pray if I do that God will just knock me right off of that because I am who I am by the grace of God. That's all of us. And we're all just changed by God's grace and by His love and mercy. And for that, we are thankful and grateful. So thank you for being here today. If you're visiting, we're glad you're here. You are our honored guest, and we're always glad to have you. And I hope you'll come back and worship with us again. If I can help you in any way, please don't hesitate to call me. My my phone number's published in the bulletin. So um, that's my cell number. I've always got it with me. So if you need me, you can call or text me anytime. Um, Let me remind you that Financial Peace University will begin next Sunday afternoon at 4.30. And uh, um, initially, we'll probably meet uh, in the conference room back in the back part, and then we'll kind of decide from there. I've got a sign-up sheet out in the foyer, and I know several folks have told me that they want to take it. And if you told me, I've got your name down, but I still want you to sign the sign-up sheet if you don't get to it today, don't worry about it. You can still come next Sunday. But next Sunday will, will be the deadline uh, to be a part of the class. And it's going to be a great class learning how to biblically handle what God has entrusted to us. And it's, more, it's about more than, much more than just money. And so I hope that you'll come and, and be a part of that if you can be. Deacon's meeting at 4.15 this afternoon. Discipleship training at 5, worship at 6. All right, anything else before we dismiss? All right. Hope you have a great afternoon. Uh, Looks like some sunshine coming through, so a little warmer weather. That's good. And I hope to see you in the Lord's house tonight. All right. Let's bow together. We'll have our closing prayer. Jay, will you lead us, please?